and cancel our engagement. Dr. Oh, come in! Will you? I am the most widely misquoted man in America. And my friends do it, I resent it. And so well, where's the fire? Schultz, I shall find it intolerable. Hand me that washcloth, please. Turn Mr. off that TV, will you? Mr. First, you know it's Sunday? What do you want anyway, me or Ritter? You. I need a lawyer that I know. Your face does look vaguely familiar. I'm Mrs. Brown, Hattie Brown. I nursed your mother four years ago during her last illness. Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, please excuse the appearance as soon as I fell asleep. Well, sit down. Sit down. Well, what's wrong? You've been reading about it from the look. Well, I held over from Ritter? What's that got to do with you? She's my daughter. Well, you're in the wrong neighborhood, Mrs. Brown. You need a big shot lawyer. And you need him quick. And what do we do for money? Print it? Nothing you can hawk? How much cash do you have on hand? About eleven $1 hundred dollars. That might pay the stenography bill. You wouldn't consider taking the case? No, 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 no. Like anybody else, lawyers have to eat. And you have to have a modicum of faith in your client, too. Mr. Santini, my daughter's innocent. Okay, okay, okay. She's convinced you. Now, if you'll excuse me, i got to go next door and get a bite to eat. Now, put in the old cut on the grill for me. Make it a small bottle, Jack. Sure, thank Shave. There's a steak on the grill for me, Liz. Bring it over to the table when it's ready. Right, your mother always said you were a great man. You worked your way through Harvard Law School. Don't do that. I don't like sentiment. Mr. Santini. Please don't. Let's fight. I want to eat, not fight. And I would prefer to eat alone. You brought up money. Well, I could sign a note. I could pay Look it off a month lawyer, by a month. Look at who can carry you. I can. I'm a good practical nurse, and I make decent money. Didn't you I... hear what I said, Mrs. Brown? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I wasn't listening. What was it? You think my daughter's guilty. Uh, and let's not go into that again. Now, please. I never realized before what money meant. But you're a young man. What are you so money mad about? Well, who's talking about me? Look, I doubt it, but suppose your daughter is innocent. This state, any state, they'll throw in a hundred trained experts to prove she's guilty. They've got them in squads and platoons, great big trained experts. This state stands ready to spend a quarter of a million dollars to prosecute and convict your daughter. Now, what have you got to spend in her defense? Your mother love? Those fingers you'll work to the bone? Now, Mrs. Brown, can you afford to pay for one train That's not the law. The law says she's innocent. Innocent until she's proven guilty. Excuse me. That's the fine theory of it. But the law is what I told you, Mrs. Brown, not what you see in TV shows. <laughs> Mrs. Mars? The name's Santini. I'm a lawyer. Your mother asked me to see you. It'll help if you look at me while I'm talking. Frankly, I'm prejudiced against married women who go out in traffic. Play around. You don't sound very friendly. We'll chum up another day. The police are claiming that you and your boyfriend, Larry Ellis, 
They claim you jointly planned and murdered your husband. Mike's death is accidental. It was not planned. Hmm? How do you explain Ellis' alibi? Alibi. What alibi? Well, you're not in the ballpark. Don't throw me curves, Mrs. M. You don't know Ellis laid out a perfect alibi before the so-called accidental shooting. No. Either you're lying, or your boyfriend Ellis is a bit of a rat. But I've told the truth. It was an accident. An alibi. There was something. But it had to do with Larry's mother. If I could piece things together. Where do you think you're traveling, Mrs. Morris? Travel uh, goes up, comes down, nothing good hurts. I tell you. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, Joe. But your old lady bugs me. Maybe you ought to treat her with a little simple respect. Why? Do I get any respect around here? I wish you'd remember, Mike, that she does us the favor by living here. She, cooks she wins a medal. A leather medal. Why don't you learn to sew on buttons? Mike, I think you'd better go to work. What? I think you'd better go to work. Oh, yeah, I know. What's your hurry? Here's your hat. Hello, goodbye. fish. Honestly, Joe, why don't we three girls just pack up and leave? We can just as well get a bulldog for company. Are you going to the movies tonight? I thought I might. What? No particular reason. Why aren't you calling? Hunch you were seeing quite a bit of that man, that accountant. Don't shake your head, Joe. I'm your mother, not your judge. You have a right to a little happiness. All right, I did see him for lunch or a movie or something like that. But I, I broke it off. Is he married? No. No. No, she passed away. But he has a little son he adores. I imagine that's all he lives for. That boy. Why did you break with him? Well, I felt very much at home in his company. I guess, I guess I didn't like where it was heading. Deep water? Did he love you? He asked me to leave Mike and marry him. But I couldn't very well do that with Avis. Could I? 
yourself one hell of a Christmas present, didn't you? I'll do the dishes. Leave them, leave them. I can live without a movie. So I die a letter from the Board of Health. Take a bath. I'll run up to Tuck Avis and... It's tax time, Joe. He might still be at his office. Call him. Joe Morris. Well, since it's tax time, it occurred to me. I thought maybe we might meet for a moment. What? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Gone and gotten himself married again? I may not be back until very late. What happened? His his little boy was killed in an auto accident about a month ago. Hungry? 
No. You. <laughs> I went off onto the concert. Was my face red? It's cute. What beautiful cufflinks! Yeah, they're solid, huh? They used to make things to last. They were my father's. What did your father do? He's a small town banker. Money, money, money. Yum, yum, yum. You never told me that. What happened? A crash happened. Couldn't take it. It's all a dreamy ball, isn't it? What is? L I F E, life. See, I'm a man with a big gift for cliches. I've never seen you take three drinks before. Maybe I have a few talents you don't know about. Am I ever going to see you again? Ever tonight? I don't know. But you know that I want to, don't you? Would you take care of me tonight if I had another drink or two? Yes. Must we have them here? One night soon, can I take a peek at your little girl? I'll be as quiet as a mouse. Maybe tonight, huh? Some other time. It's so late, dear. All right. Suppose Mike got Avis. He'd move in with his father and brother. A whole family of cops. All cops, the three. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Hello, Head. Uh, I wish I were a poet. I want to say something tender. Don't. You'll make me cry. I'd better take you home. And I'm sorry that I have to go to Sacramento this weekend. My oldest friend, Maury Getz. Once a year, I balance up his books. Well, we have to go to somebody's wedding Sunday night. But I'll think of you. I told you that I was going to stay at my hotel tonight. Mother, I told you this morning, but you've forgotten. And please, I've asked you a dozen times not to call me at this hour. You got me out of a sound sleep. All right. Goodbye. Mothers. Hey, it's raining hard. Maybe violence. <laughs> How many times did you sleep with Ellis? Now, don't be shy. The questions they ask you in court, they'll curl your hair. Once. Just once. That's the pathetic truth? That's the truth. Any other boyfriends? Never? Continue, excuse me, go on. Well, we're going to have to get new screens again. This is one thing, it's another. You wearing a girdle, you look as slim as an Italian pistol. I never had any problems about hips. Why don't we get along? What's the matter? Oh, I know, I know. I sometimes dish it out, but you don't take things light enough. I mean, you don't think when I say I'll kick her in the slats to the kid, I really mean it. 
What's important is whether Avis thinks you mean it. It's nice having a head like you at home. When is your insurance man coming, Mike? Ten, twenty minutes. So is Woolworths. Mike, please. You've got your insurance man coming in a minute. Quite a blue note this last year. What's your private name for me, Poison Ivy? Don't forget, kid. In my trade, I can get it any place. They put out and I take. You, I'm talking to you with that fake phone company supervisor's accent. Uh, you got yourself a boyfriend somewhere. My God. Yes. Here's your insurance man. Yeah, yeah, coming. Problem, huh? Come in, Mr. Myers. Come in. Sit down. Joe. Sit down. Joe, the insurance guy is here. Ah, what a nice home you have here. Ah, oh, Mrs. Morris, what a spotless little home you keep. Does that thing is that thing is work? Oh, this. Oh, yes, indeedy. When I tune this up, I can even hear a mouse walk. Now, may I ask, uh, I'm here to serve, but I wasn't quite clear on the phone. Yeah, well, the missus thinks... Do you smoke? Oh, no, thank you. I gave that up. The missus thinks it's time we took out a real chunk of insurance. We don't grow any younger, do we? <laughs> if only more young folks had your sensible attitude, the world would be a better place to live in. Do I gather it rightly... Detective Morris, you were thinking somewhere in the 20,000 range. Something really comprehensive, including disability? Yeah, including disability, yeah. Somewhere around there, 20,000. Around there. 30. Why not 50 or 60? That's my missus. Champagne taste with beer money. That's my missus. Of course you realize, and I don't have to tell you, there are several fine plans for a small family. Mike, do you think we can afford those quarterly insurance payments? Mm -hmm. I said, do you think we can afford those quarterly insurance payments? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There we go again. I can't do anything right around here, can I? Forget it. You and your old lady are a pair and a half. Man likes to get a little credit in his own home. Don't that ever occur to you? Even a dog wags his tail when you throw him a bone. Did you hear what I said? All you know is to take my paycheck when I bring it home. I left a phone company job at $90 a week to marry you, and I'd just as soon get it back. <laughs> that'll be the day. Over my dead body, that'll be the day. It don't occur to you that I got problems, does it? What did you want me to tell that insurance guy that I'm growing deaf on both ears? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right, you with the eyebrows. That's right. And if the department ever finds out, I'm off the force like that. Did you see a doctor about it? Hell of a lot you care. You might have told me. I'm your wife. Having a drink with my old man. What time does the shindig begin tomorrow night? The wedding, eight. Okay. Who's this? We're not buying anything today, lady. Not even samples. <laughs> well, <laughs> not buying anything. <laughs> You're Mrs. Morris? Yes. That was your husband, I presume. 
May I sit down? Oh, would you please? Thank you. I'm Larry Ellis's mother. Oh, I'm glad to meet you, Mrs. Ellis. Forgot my keys again. Mrs. Morris, I've made in my lifetime considerable sacrifice for my son. It was done, of course, with no sense of sacrifice. He is, after all, my only child. I prefer candor to beating around the bush. A proper marriage might be the best thing in the world for Larry, as no one is more aware than his own mother. But a sordid affair with a police officer's wife is quite another thing. You must... That sharp talk, and I find it very offensive. I do not I... wish to be diverted. You mean let you do all the talking? That is correct. You must stop seeing my son. Don't you think you're taking too much into your hands? I should be perfectly willing to put the entire matter in your husband's hands. Yes, you're right. Larry's mother is completely unscrupulous where her son's welfare is concerned. What did you do? Have us followed? Yes. And if it gives you some perverse satisfaction, it costs like the Dickens, too. Does Larry know about this? I may have to trip up to Sacramento tomorrow night or tomorrow. Everything in its own good time, my dear. Hello. Hello. Mommy, who's that nice lady? Oh, Go get some milk, darling. And cookies, too. I'm starved. Operator, I want to place a person-to-person -person call to Sacramento. You'll be back in dreamy land in about three minutes, darling. Come on. Watch your step. No summer way pajamas, nothing summer way. I'll get Avis to bed. My, my, that's a fast little girl. I have to turn to wash my hands, Mommy. Well, don't bother. It's so late. Happy dreams, Mommy. And happy dreams to you, Bumpkin. Good night, Mommy. Good night, Mother.
My mother phoned me last night. Let me see her face. She wanted to come up to Sacramento, but I put her off. I said I'd be back on Tuesday. In fact, with friend Maury's help, I laid out a perfect alibi in case she tried to phone or reach me again. An alibi? You that much afraid of her? No, I guess I'm more afraid of myself, to coin her phrase. Either I tread an eggs around her or blow my top. Either one is very human, is it? I was worried that you were worried. That's why I mean. Larry, 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 forgive me, but, but your mother has had us followed. She's ruthless. doubt after the other night. Diane. Mm -hmm. What do you do now? Wing it right back to Sacramento on the next plane. You're out of your lovely mind. Never left your husband's hand, huh? No. What about your kid? Did you hear the shot? No. Neither did the neighbors. In June, with all the open windows. Now, who helped you make up that story? Your parakeet? No, we'd gone to the wedding. I closed and locked them. And then I forced Larry to leave. Why have him found there? I mean, in terms of unnecessary scandal. Oh, stupid, real stupid. When did you call the police? Several minutes later. Then my mother walked in, coming off a case. It was about that time you told the police the lie about the imaginary prowler. Yes. I'm not sure. I may see you tomorrow. In the meantime, remember, you're not here to win friends and influence people. Talk to no one, not even the cat. Tell me, how did they tie this guy Ellis into the case with her? He dropped an initial cufflink in her kitchen. The endearing stunk. Now, when they questioned him up in Sacramento, he claimed he never even heard of Joe Morris. He had been sick up there in a hotel bed, he claimed. Nowhere near LA at all. Then, like a big red ruby, they find it in his trash basket. The stub of his return plane ticket from LA that night. Now what? They tearing each other to pieces? Oh. Don't. That's what impresses me. No ratting out. They're protecting each other. Not themselves. Pay that other girl. She's a volunteer. A volunteer? Yeah. She is? Yeah. Alice. Friend of a friend of mine. College girl.
Thank you, Alice. Captain Kelly. Well, how's our busy district attorney this morning? Busy. He's in conference with his best assistant. Is it important, Captain? Yep. Well, just knock and enter. A new insurance policy on her husband's life. It is a handsome tidbit for us. The lady looks slick to me. Slick and cool. I'll make her hot. Yes? Captain Kelly, you are much on my mind. Anything yet on hotels, motels? No. Nope. You know we need real proof that Ellis worked on something more than just her tax figure. Sally, I got 30 men out with photographs, but they're investigators, not manufacturers. Don't disappoint us, dear. Maybe he's your best cross-examiner, but he certainly isn't my type. What's that for? Just between you and me. Well, that's a good ten-cent cigar. If I take the bands off, they look expensive. I uh, take these home. My grandkids, their finger rings. Smoke? What, a cheap ten-cent cigar? Now, uh, what about Maury Getz? Tell us his alibi friend up in Sacramento. We're going to hold him as an accomplice to crime? No charges. No, sorry. You treat him with kid gloves. He doesn't know it yet, but he's a star witness for our side. You see, there's three sides to this case, not two. All with conflicting interests. Now, don't you think for one minute, Mrs. Morris, that you and Alice are in this case together? But we're both innocent, Maybe right? not. Take the tussle that fired off the gun. You were no party to that tussle, were you? Not exactly, but In I no thought... sense, Mrs. M. And by your own words, you did not invite Ellis there that night. Isn't that right? Well, it is and it isn't. He certainly didn't come there to murder, Mark. Well, how do you know? All you Mrs. know Santini, is... Mrs. Santini, you don't have to chew my head off. Joe, listen to what they're saying, Joe. Mrs. Morris, it is in our interest to discredit Ellis as much as we can. But what do you mean by discredit? Well, for example, how did you meet him? Can you say, for instance, that you seduced him? This will be said in court, Joe. There was no seduction on either side. It was a matter of mutual sympathy, that's all. Didn't you know what might happen? Where were your eyes? Mr. Santini, the average woman doesn't live with her eyes. She lives with her hopes. Wait, go wait a minute. Wait, wait. Ma'am, uh... We understand your feelings, but the uh, prosecution aside, what do you think his lawyers will do when they get in court? Whatever they do or say in court, they'll have to prove it, won't they? Mrs. M., your boyfriend's alibi is a passport to hell. If necessary, they will prove in court that you stole the Golden Gate Bridge and hid it in a thimble. Joe, Joe, dear Excuse child. Excuse me, mother. I Excuse me. I'm sorry. I cannot let them smear Larry. No worries, Larry, no worries. And you can be sure, Larry, just as if you were my own boy, we'll be right on our toes all the time. The court's opening, Counselor. Thank you, sir. Remember this, dear. Your lawyers have as much faith in you as your mother does. When do we finish picking the jury? We finished picking the jury Friday. Huh? Oh, I must have been wandering in greener fields. Larry, think not the struggle, naught availeth. Don't worry, Mrs. Ellis. Judge Carey, how is it possible that in three weeks your investigator has found out nothing about Mrs. Morris? A woman like that must have a past. Jonas will find something if there's anything to be found. I can't do more than that, ma'am. Everyone rise, please. In the presence of the flag of the United States, the emblem of the Constitution, and for liberty and justice for all, Department 115 of the Superior Court in the state of California, and in and for the County of Los Angeles, now in session. The Honorable Edgar Nielsen, Judge Presiding. You 
seated, please. Come to order. In the case of the people, this is Josephine Morris and Lawrence Ellis. Let the records show that the jury and alternates are in the box. Both defendants are present with counsel, and the state of California is represented by Mr. Nordau, the district attorney, and Mr. Stanley of his office. Do counsel waive the reading of the indictment? We shall waive. We do, sir. The people may now open. May it please the court. Counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The defendants are accused by the grand jury of Los Angeles County of the crimes of murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Now, in order that you may better follow the evidence on which the indictment was found, I'm going to briefly outline the evidence to you. Officer Morris, are you the younger brother of Michael Morris, the deceased? I am. The defendant, Josephine Morris, is your sister-in-law? Yes. But I wish she wasn't. Objection. Only answer what you ask. Is this a photograph of your brother? Yes. Your Honor, we offer this photograph in evidence, People's Exhibit Number 1. No objection, sir. No objection, sir. It was received in evidence and marked People's Exhibit Number 1. Officer Morris, on the morning of June 15th, were you called to the coroner's office for the purpose of identifying your brother's remains? I was. And did you at that time view and identify the remains? I did. Thank you. Bench my crossing down. No question, sir. You may step down. Proceed. Oh, by the way, Mr. Hauser, who was getting married that night? My youngest daughter, Ethel. It was a catered supper, 52 guests. Tell us, Mr. Hauser, were intoxicating drinks served there that night? Yes, sir, they were. Well, now, what, if anything, did you observe in reference to such drinks served to Mrs. Morris? Well, I observed she was not drinking. Then someone said to me later, Hauser, isn't it in order for another round? So I went for another bottle, and she says, Mrs. Morris says, Oh, I won't take a drink, Mr. Hauser, with a wave of her hand like that. Give my portion to Mike. On the next round, she didn't take it either. She gave it to Mike. I says to myself, Hauser, she's trying to load him up. You mean get him drunk? Yes, sir. That's all, Mr. Hauser. Thank you. No cross-examination, Your Honor. Mr. Hauser, did the Morrises come to other parties at your house? Yes, sir. Prior to the wedding night... No. Oh, no, no. Continue. Excuse me. Go on. Prior to the wedding night, there was their Halloween. And that night, Mrs. Morris didn't object to being one of the crowd. She took her drinks just like the rest of us. In fact, I would say she was a very heavy drinker. You mean that at other times she drank a lot? Yes. But on the wedding night, not at all. Did you ever see her drunk? Well, I wouldn't go that far. It's hard to measure. Mr. Hauser, how would you measure what you call a very heavy drinker? For a woman, a lady? Mm-hmm. One before and one after supper. That, to me, is a very heavy drinker. Wait, would you repeat that to the jury, please? One before and one after. That, to me, is a very heavy drinker. Thank you, sir. But don't you think so for a woman? I came down from Sacramento with no legal fuss on the explicit promise that I could speak to Larry first. Now, he's my oldest friend. We were kids together. They, they don't come off the tree any sweeter. With all, with all due respect, I, I don't believe he did this thing. Well, suppose we'll let you hear it from his own lips. Captain Kelly will take you right up. Thanks. The gentleman from Sacramento sweats. Did you know that Ellis kept a room in a local hotel by the month? How did you find that out? Unlike 30 or 40 stupid detectives, I went through his canceled checks. Meet the night clerk of the Hotel Le Grand. Come in, Mr. Lemke. Mr. District Attorney? Yeah? I am a friend of God's. 
Well, that's a very enviable position. Yes, that's the kind of man I am. Whenever I'm able, I do God's good work. Right now, I'm here about Ellis and his lady friend. Mr. Lemke, please sit in that very comfortable chair. Thank you. Here's your man. Harry. Harry. They've been printing a lot of lies about you, guy. No, Maury, it's, it's true. I did it. You mean you actually killed that man? Yes. Self-defense. He accidentally, he tried to shoot me down. Well, I... I guess I had to hear it from your own mouth. Larry, they, uh... They want me to tell the truth about the alibi. I'm going to have to do it. Of course, Murray. Of course. Maybe the next time I see you, it'll be in court. And you'll be fighting for your life. I'm going to have to testify against you. Don't worry, Murray. Don't worry. Mr. Lipke, how long have you been the night clerk there? At the Legrand, three years from October 12th. How do you pinpoint that date so exactly? How? Simple. It's Columbus Day. Can't forget that. Do you see Mr. Ellis in this room? Yeah. Sitting right there. And the record show that the witnesses identified the defendant Ellis. You see Mrs. Morris, too? Yeah. Right there. There? At the record so state. You sure about that, Mr. Lemke? Well, I wouldn't say it otherwise, would I? Don't forget I'm here under solemn oath. Well, now, tell us, please, when did you first see these two defendants together? Objection. It is not established that he has ever seen them together. Well, let us establish it, then. Did you ever see those two together? I should say I have. At the Hotel of Grand. That would be uh, June 11th, uh, Thursday night. What makes you so sure about that date? Birthday. Mine. And what, Mr. Witness, did the defendants do there that night? Well, <clears throat> I drove them up to his floor, and they went to his room. That was uh, just short of 12, around 2. Yeah. 2, uh, 220. They left. So that for two hours or more, they occupied the room. They occupied his room together, yes. Your Honor, to save time, we concede the fact that my client did appear in Ellis's room. Regretfully, I cannot accept defense's stipulation. The purpose of this testimony is not to prove adultery. Now, just a minute. Adultery has not been proved. The court understands that the purpose of the testimony offered is to establish motive. Precisely, sir, exactly. I withdraw the stipulation and will examine the witness later. The jury has admonished that the defenders are not here on trial for adultery. Mr. Witness, there is no doubt in your mind that these defendants occupied the same room together. No. No doubt. None whatsoever. No. None. None whatsoever. Now, what does occupy mean to you? Tell the jury, please. Well, uh, well, I wouldn't care to say in public. Let's call a spade a spade. You mean fornication? That's what I mean, mister. Lemke, is it not a fact that the Hotel Le Grand has a very bad name? It's not my business what people say. Don't you cater that to transient trade? Couples who register under false names for an hour or two? How do I know it's false don't names? Couples, That's their business, Don't many of mine. these couples stay for an hour or two, yes or no? Yes. Without luggage? Yes, but after is all, they take... Is it legal to rent hotel rooms for the purposes of illicit sex? Yes or no, Mr. Lemke? No. And yet, night after night, you register such couples there, don't you? Objection, Your Honor. Those questions are immaterial, irrelevant, and incompetent. The court finds it pertinent will permit it. Proceed. You do or you don't illegally register such couples there? Well, I... I rent rooms. How do I know what they do? I mean, they occupy these rooms and you don't know what they do. No, how could I? Then know? how could you know what the defendants did when they occupied the Ellis's room? I guess I couldn't. Louder, louder, we didn't hear you. I say I couldn't. Know. You couldn't know what? I couldn't know what they did. Thank you, Mr. Lunky. You're a very honest man. How many times, Mr. Lauber, did you call at their home? Just the once. The once. And uh, at that time, did Mr. Morris state to you why he wanted more insurance? Yes. They weren't growing any younger, he said, than his wife wanted. In what amount did Mr. Morris say he was seeking a new policy? In the neighborhood of twenty or thirty thousand, he said. I wrote it up for thirty, and the beneficiary was the wife. Well, when he said uh, he wanted a policy of twenty or thirty thousand, 
Did his wife offer any comment? She did. She said, and I'm quoting her exactly, mind you. She said, why not 50 or 60,000, she said. So then you wrote the policy for $30,000 according to Mr. Morris's wishes. That's right. But she, his wife, had suggested a $60,000 policy. Yeah, yes, 50, 60,000, yes. Thank you, Mr. Lava. That's all. You're a witness, Counselor. I only need a few minutes of your time. Relax, Mr. Lover. I'm relaxed. <laughs> Mr. Lover, as between two honest men, you do realize the importance of your testimony, don't you? Well, it's a question of motive. Of the insurance, whether she wanted it or didn't, then what amounts? Exactly. Mr. Lover, how long were you in the Morris home on this visit? Mm, a good hour. A good hour. And would you tell us what you remember Mrs. Morris saying during that good hour? Saying about what? Oh, about any topic under the sun. Anything she said. Well, she certainly did say, why not 50 or 60,000? I heard it myself. Well, your hearing's not in question. What else do you remember her saying? I don't remember. Do you mean by that that you don't remember? Or that she did say other things which you no longer remember? Well, it all boils down to this. She didn't say another thing. You mean in all the good hour you were there, she said nothing else? Except when not 50 or 60. That's right. Not another word? Not another one. Miss Lauber, please tell us again, how long have you been in this business? Close to 40 years. Then would you tell us as a specialist, don't people who shop around for insurance ask you lots of questions? And how? They'd like to know what their money is buying. And during the good hour you were there, Mrs. Morris asked not a single question. Not a one. But Mr. Morris did. And how? All around the mulberry bush, no one was cheating him. And actually, Mrs. Morris said not a word? Not even a few pleasantries? Uh, she wasn't very pleasant. But she did say, why not 50 or 60,000? Yes. Were there any disability clauses in this policy? This policy contains very good disability features. Loss of limbs, loss of eyes. Loss of hearing, too? That was covered, too. Were you pleased when you left the Morris home that afternoon? Sure. It's a nice commission. It adds up. Tell me, wouldn't you have been more pleased if it had been a $60,000 policy? Who wouldn't? Sure. Well, then, if she said 50 or 60, why didn't you try for that instead of only 30? Why? Because she sounded like she didn't mean it. She didn't mean it? The witness did not state she didn't mean it. If the court please, may I have the answer read back? Why? Because she sounded like she didn't mean it. Is that what you said, Mr. Lauber? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Lauber, what does that mean? It sounded like she didn't mean it. Well, you know, uh, like a typical wife, maybe they had a fight, flippant, sarcastic. She didn't mean it. Thank you sincerely, Mr. Lauber. That's all. Relax for me, too, sir. Where was Mrs. Morris when her husband asked you all these questions? Sitting right there. Well, wasn't she getting the benefit of your answers to her husband's questions? Mm, I guess. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Why guess? Look, that's my business. I know if somebody's interested in the policy or not. She wasn't even listening. Why didn't you tell us that before? Well, you never asked me before. It never occurred to me until this gentleman brought it out. <laughs> well... See now. I doubt if the DA can put that broken egg together. And print me a little note, please. Just a few words. Tell me what happened to Polly on a farm. Did she ever go home after her visit? I'm sending some real live kisses with Grandma. So we'll just end now with plenty of love. Happy dreams, Pumpkin. Mr. Getz, you say that Ellis told you he'd have to take a quick trip down to L.A. Uh, what more did he say? Uh, just the substance. He didn't want it known that he'd gone down to L.A. that night. You wanted to hide that fact? Yes, and uh, would I help him? What was the what was the nature of that help? 
Well, the substance was that he... Uh, Larry was to write two letters. Later, I was to mail them for a later postmark. And I was to phone down to the desk and say I was sick in bed. You'd call down later as Ellis and put a stop on the phone, but actually he'd be in L.A. by then. Or on the way, yes. So that to all intents and purposes, Ellis would appear not to have left his Sacramento hotel that night. Yes, I, uh, I suspect he was afraid... Now, when did you uh, see or hear from Ellis next? In his room with the Gaylord later the next day when he'd returned from here from L.A. Now, did anything come up then about how you had helped him? Yes, he thanked me. No, but could you tell us the exact words he used? But I'm trying very hard to remember. I thought I gave you the substance. Not the substance. Can you tell us exactly what he said? He said, he said the... Uh, Alibi worked out fine, and he thanked you. He used the word alibi? The alibi had worked out fine, and he thanked you. Yes, but not... That's all, Mr. Getz. Thank you very much. Mr. Getz, are you fully aware that you are under solemn oath on that witness stand? Yes, I am. So help you God. So help me God. Did you have a visitation with the district attorney in his office here last week? Yes, I came down here, and I told them everything I know. What's all that con about? Wait for the question. He's treading water. I don't know why. I'm not asking you to surmise, but to answer my questions. Why doesn't he get to the real stuff about the mother? He's trying to protect Mrs. Ellis. She pays the Were you threatened with arrest by anyone in the district attorney's office? He's going to hang his client. That'll do. Thank you. Mr. Gates, the two letters Ellis asked you to mail... Oh, the ordinary post? Uh, no, they were sent special delivery. Uh -huh. And to whom were they addressed, if you know? One to his mother, one to himself, to his office. Well, he wasn't trying to fool himself with the later postmark, was he? Objection. That would be mere guesswork from this witness. Sustained. Mr. Getz, think back carefully. Did Ellis in any way offer you any reasons why he needed that alibi? Yes, yes, he did. Yes or no? Did it concern his mother? Yes, I can Wait tell you another question. In his own words, what explanation did he offer? Well, he said, uh, it was like this. He said, my mother's been snooping again. She's apt to fly up here while I'm down. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Does it please the court? The people rest. Defendant Morris is prepared to go on without delay, Your Honor. The defendant Morris may know. No objections, Your Honor. No objection. Proceed. Mrs. Brown, what, in your opinion, made your daughter marry him? Well, for one thing, he was a war hero. And he was much better natured then. Besides, she wanted a child. And they had a fine little child, did they not? Yes, they did. They certainly did. And what, may I ask, gave you such confidence in your daughter? I know what a blessing I have in that girl. When she was 15, her father got sick. And she went to work and supported us until he died. She never complained about it. She's never stayed out nights in her life. She sews and she cooks like an angel. She's just about the best mother I've ever seen. She's a modest and fair-minded girl. As all those people down there at the telephone company would tell you. And she's a truthful girl, too. I think that is all, Mrs. Brown. Thank you. Come to order. The people may now resume their cross-examination. Sit back, ma'am. I have no desire to frighten you. I know how to sit, Mr. Stanley. Why do you smile, ma'am? Would you really like to know? I ask the questions here. Why? 
because you're purring like a pussycat, but you'd really like to knock my head off. <laughs> Is it not a fact, Mrs. Brown, that you told the police the story of a prowler breaking into the house that fatal night? Yes. You told a false story that night, did you not? Yes, but I thought it was true. The fact is that the false story of the prowler was told to you by your daughter. Is that not so? Yes. In other words, your model daughter, so thoughtful, so honest, she lied even to you, her own mother. Yes. Your daughter quit school at age 15 to go to work. What was her first job? Call her brother's stores. When did she start with the telephone company? About a year later. She took the night shift because it paid more. Did you not state that your daughter never stayed out nights? Yes, but we're... No buts, madam. Yes or no? Yes. Now you tell us that at the tender years of from 16 on, she was out every night. Objection. That is innuendo and unproven fact. Yes, Mr. Steve. If you please the court, will counsel for defense be seated? What is he, a movie star? Oh. Uh, every night, like... Cops answer questions when you're asked. Did you know about her boyfriend, Ellis? Yes, I knew. Did you perhaps encourage that relationship? No. But if I could have, I would. If you could have, you would. Madam, what sort of house were you running there? Objection! I withdraw the question. It's unnecessary. No comments, please. I'm finished with your witness, Mr. Santini. You may step down, madam. If it please the court, I will call Mrs. Morris to the stand in her own behalf. Now, madam, you are not required to take the stand as a witness. But if you do so, you are subject to the state's cross-examination. The court now asks you whether you choose to take the stand or to remain off. The law privileges you to do either. I will take it. Proceed. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Take the stand. State your name. Please spell your last name. Josephine Morris. M-O-R-R-I-S. Quiet. Where were you born, Mrs. Morris? In Fresno, California. And at that time, during this unhappy mood, you met the defendant, Ellis? Yes. And why did you continue to see him? He was a widower with one child... A boy. He seemed so alone. He aroused your sympathy, you mean? Very much so. Your Honor, may I suggest that she be permitted to talk instead of being prompted and led by her counsel? Yes, do not lead the witness. Do not tell her what to say. Now, wasn't there a time when you broke with Mr. Ellis? Yes. One night we'd been to a movie. I made up my mind to say goodbye. You see, he needed a home and a wife for his child, and... Since I couldn't help him either way, I suggested that we part company. And did you part from each other that night? Yes. And did you later resume your friendship? We did. And when and how did that come about? Well, it was tax time. Earlier this year, I... And that night, for the first and only time, you became intimate? Yes. The only time? Yes. Try raising your voice a little, ma'am. It was at his hotel room, was it not? Yes, yes. The only time. Yes. Now, let me ask you. Did you love your husband? No. But uh, did you love him when you married him? Yes, of course, but, but he could be very wounding. In bad moods when he was drinking, he... Well, there was nothing he would not say or do. Well, he had no respect for anything alive except his father and... He was afraid of him. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you'd like me to say otherwise, but... But I couldn't love him. It was too painful. Would you say that your love for your husband had turned to hate? No. I don't think the opposite of love is ever hate. It's indifference. I simply grew indifferent. Mrs. Morris, you lied to your mother about the way your husband met his death, true? Yes. 
I wanted to spare her the pain and the burden. And knowing her, she might try to take the blame herself. The people may now examine the witness. How did Ellis get into your dandy little kitchen the night your husband was shot, Mrs. Morris? I let him in. You unlocked the back door yourself and let him in? Yes. How are you dressed? In a robe and nightgown. Slippers. You mean, knowing Ellis was waiting below, you went upstairs and stripped? Yes, but I didn't go... No buts, ma'am. Then you went down in your nightgown and robe and let him in. Yes. Your husband always provided for you and your child, did he not? Yes. Paid for the house, did he not? Yes. The car in your garage, he paid for it? Yes. Your mother has been living with you for about how long? Four years about. Four years about. Did she pay your husband rent? No, but she, she did a lot of... No buts, ma'am. Your husband always provided you with clothes? Yes. Likewise the child? Yes. Was the house in your husband's name or in your name and his? Both. Was your bank account joined? Yeah, joined. Were you aware that in the event of your husband's death, you, as joint owner of his real estate and bank account, would inherit all? Well, it's something that never occurred to me. I never... Answer yes or no, madam. Yes, unless... Yes is an answer. Is it true that you picked up Ellis in a public place like a movie house? Now, one moment. She did not say that she picked him up. It is not what the jury should believe, Your Honor. Objection sustained. It implies too much. Did Your Honor sustain the objection? Yes. Tell the jury, Mrs. Ellis, how long did it take you to concoct that lie about the prowl? What? Your husband is lying on the kitchen floor. Did you look to see whether he was still alive or did you fictionize first? I looked to see. And he was dead? Yes. How many minutes did it take you to uh, cook up that lie? Five, ten? Come, madam, give us your best figure. I can't remember. I was confused and I got... In a matter of minutes, you concoct a story that deludes your mother, fools the best police brains for weeks, and you are confused? Were you confused when Ellis asked you to marry him? When Ellis... No. He proposed twice, you said? Yes. What about the insurance, ma'am? More confusion there? I don't follow that question. I don't see how she can, Your Honor. Let Mr. Stanley proceed. Perhaps you can help me, Mrs. Morris, because I confess I myself am a very confused bunny about that insurance deal. It was my husband's idea, not mine. Oh, you were indifferent to the whole thing. Isn't that what you said? That's right. You knew the premiums were excessive in relation to your husband's pay? I was sure of it, yes. Did you try to stop your husband from signing on the dotted line? Not at the time, no. Not at the time, no. Isn't that because you already had a plan about how to use the proceeds of that insurance policy? No, never, never. Have you ever planned a long trip abroad? I thought about it once or twice. Do you recognize these travel folders, Mrs. Morris? Yes. Do you also recognize the signature on the Northern Lights tour? Yes. The signature's mine. I ask the court that these be placed in evidence and numbered. No objection. No objection. Sir. Now, as to the pencil markings inside the folder, they're yours too? Yes. May I let the jurors examine these exhibits? Yes. Madam, where in your home did you keep these folders? I don't remember. Would you say you hid them from your husband? Not in the least. They were of no value. Isn't it a fact that if your late husband saw these folders, he would draw unwelcome conclusions? No. Then why were they hidden in the piano bench? They weren't hidden. They were in the bench with some old magazines and things. Don't you mean discreetly under old magazines and things? Mr. Stanley, I've often had travel brochures. Are these I... figures yours? This arithmetic? Yes. In your own figures? $3,400 for the Northern Lights tour for one. Yes. Do you have that sort of money in the bank? No. But you would if your husband died abruptly, would you not? We're waiting for your answer. I can't answer that. You must answer, madam. And the answer is no. You mean you wouldn't get your husband's insurance money after he died? Yes, but... Madam, with your husband out of the way, didn't you intend to take that luxury trip with Ellis? No. How many times do you sleep with Ellis? Well, I... 
We're waiting for your answer. I can't remember. So many times you can't remember? Uh, no. One time. One time. Did you give him your time. body in the kitchen that night? No. Husband was upstairs asleep. Yes. You went down to be with Ellis. Yes. He came all the way from Sacramento. Yes. Yeah. Concerned for you, didn't you say? Yes. This man travels for eight hours back and forth just to express concern. You don't give him the comfort of your own body. Bruno, I object. He is badgering her with the intent to prejudice the jury. Yes, move along, Mr. Stanley. And Ellis, you say, asked you several times to marry him. Yes. And you refused. You were indifferent to it. Yes. And so instead, you become an adulterous wife. Were you proud of that? No, I was ashamed of it. No woman feels proud of breaking her marriage vows. Did you not continue seeing Mr. Ellis after you turned down his proposals? Yes. And he, on his side, kept seeing you? Yes. I kept seeing him as a friend. Oh, you kept seeing him once or twice a week as a friend? Yes. Did Ellis and your husband ever meet before that night? No. You thought you could keep them apart? They would never meet? Yes. Yet you unlocked the back door that night and let Ellis in? Yeah, but I asked him not to come. You don't want him there? No. You don't want him in your home. You know it's dynamite. Well, he was there. Did I... you have to unlock the door? No. But you did unlock the door, yes or no? Yes. Wasn't that because you were told him on the telephone that you would unlock the door? No. And did you not tell him by phone that matters had come to a head? No. That I... you were frightened, that something would have to be done immediately, <laughs> let me finish, before his mother carried out her threats? No. In and no way, did no. did you not, in fact, arrange it between you and Ellis that he was to lay out an alibi? No. I say no to... While you in Burbank at the Hauser wedding... He must let her answer his questions as they are asked. She's not exactly a tape machine. I don't follow Leonard Council's objections. He objects that you do not let the witness answer each question as it is asked. I will let her answer. Madam, let's be friends. What is your answer? I ask if you had not arranged it between you about the alibi. No. And if it was not part of your plan to get your husband helplessly drunk... That is not true either. But he was helplessly drunk by the time... Yes, that night and a thousand other nights, yes. Your Honor, will you instruct the lady to answer only what she's asked? Only answer the questions, madam. It will be best. That's right, Your Honor. Hold her. Hold her with legalities while he hits her with a stick. The witness is represented by able counsel and has the full protection of the court. Proceed. We will come back to the scene in the kitchen. Tell us, Mrs. Morris, was Ellis carrying a gun? No, not at all. You are that certain? Yes. When he was off duty, where did your husband usually keep his service pistol? In the downstairs coat closet, on the top shelf. And Ellis had no gun, you say? Yes. And you let him in? Yes. Without a gun? Yes. And he told you of his alibi? Yes. Now, Mrs. Morris, isn't it a fact that you put your husband's police pistol in Ellis's hands? No. And did you not, after you had armed him, run upstairs by Prowler, Prowler? No, I did not, no. And didn't your husband, half asleep and drunk... No! ...come running downstairs to protect home and family and meet face-to-face no. -face a murderer no. armed with his own gun? No, that is not true. It simply is not true. And did not the bundling Ellis fire a shot at Mike Morris and That Miss... is not true, no! And didn't Mike, protecting home and wife, close in and grapple no. until a bullet hit no. his heart? no, no! Your Honor, the hour being late, perhaps we might recess until tomorrow. If the court please, I so move. Since the defendant is clearly unable to continue. That will do, Mr. Stanley. No comments. Mrs. Morris, I think I may have to put your child on the stand for a couple of minutes this week. I think it'll have a good effect. Mr. Santini, let's not discuss that. Avis does not appear in court. Don't misunderstand me. I think the jury I would... tell you, I won't... I won't have her memory scarred by that. Will her memory be better served by a mother going to the death house? I'm sorry, Mrs. Morris, but this case is far from one. I can't fight you. I ask you not to call Avis. May I go now, please? Yes.
I thought you all made quite a nice impression in court today. Let's not be optimistic, Mrs. Brown. She's handcuffed to Ellis in his alibi. They sink or swim together. Let's go. And I must say, I found it rather whimsical of her to come to her defense. Casey's son are usually won or lost by nuance of impression. May your snooping mother suggest that you act more cheerfully in the court. And remember this. There's nothing celestial or terrestrial that right thinking won't change. Fortunately, the only gentleman in that courtroom is Judge Nielsen himself. It's one of the great lessons of life. There's no substitute for breeding. And as I... Oh, God, help me. How do I get you off my back? Get me off your back. Larry, you were always a fanciful boy. But until you met her, you were a gentleman. Gentleman? What do you mean by gentleman? Somebody you can kick to death? God! You may call your first witness. Hold on. Keep your head. We will call it our first witness, Lawrence Ellis, in his own defense. Silence, please. Please observe the decorum of the courtroom. No moving about. Mr. Bailey. Move up to Morris in the courtroom and hold him in custody. Charges will be made later. Silas in the court. The court is still in session. Be seated, please. Are you hurt, Mr. Ellis? I'm all right, Your Honor. Does the defendant think he needs to assist? He says we'll go ahead, Your Honor. They were outraged by this shameful incident. Mr. Ellis, you have your choice either to take the stand or to remain off. But if you elect to take the stand... I'll take the stand. Proceed. I'll raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you may give yes. in the cause now pending yes. before this court? Mr. Ellis, have you ever been arrested? Not after this time, no. That is all. Your witness? You may proceed, Mr. Santini. No cross-examination, Your Honor. Then the people may proceed. Mr. Stanley will examine for the people. Mr. Ellis, do you believe in a supreme being? I think I do. Just answer yes or no and we'll get along very nicely. You do? Yes. Do you know the distance between Sacramento and L.A.? Uh, 500 miles. Now, I want you to take your time. What exactly was the reason for the trip? Well, my mother was on the warpath, and Mrs. Morris had phoned me. I wanted to tell her not to worry. So you arrived there past 2 a.m. to tell Mrs. Morris not to worry? Yes, because she was... Not because. Just yes or no. Yes. And there was no more practical reason for your trip? No. Had you been drinking that night? Yes, a bit. And all you proposed to do was to whisper some remark in your girlfriend's ear like, uh, don't mind my ma, her bark is worse than her bite? Well, I... Or did you, at last, have a plan of action, Mr. Ellis, which made the trip worthwhile and necessary? No, I had no plan. You didn't what? I said I had no plan. You hadn't arranged a plan by phone the day before? No. You didn't know her husband would return home from the wedding drunk? No. You didn't know his gun would be available? No. You hadn't arranged together to entice him downstairs by crying prowler? No, I had not. And you knew nothing of the 30,000 hard American dollars that would be resting in that lady's pocket? Nothing at Once all. her husband was dead? No. When you arrived at the Morris home at 2 a.m., were you in your right mind? Yes. You don't suffer hallucinations? No. Or take drugs of any sort? No. And you still sit here and tell us that you traveled a thousand miles for eight hours at no small expense just to tell Mrs. Morris, quote, Everything is all right. Don't worry. Unquote. Yes, and yes. that is your best and only reason for I the trip? to see her, too. What for, my friend? To see her. Why? When did you see her last? Three nights before. And uh, when did you uh, normally plan to return to Los Angeles? Tuesday or Wednesday. But on Sunday night, the urge became so irresistible, you made the trip for the sole purpose of seeing her? Something like that. Yes. Something like that is not good enough, my friend. Something like what? But I loved her. She filled my thoughts, my life. She'd become a habit of mine. 
It was a rainy day when I didn't see her. Your Honor, I failed to see the materiality of these answers. They're much too broad. Yes, they are somewhat broad, but possibly related to his reasons for the trip. <laughs> and despite all that has happened, do you still love Mrs. Morris? Yes. You admit that, do you? No, I don't admit it. I said it. To admit I love her gives it an air of crime. Didn't you feel criminal trying to steal another man's wife? Did the witness hear the question? Yes, Your Honor, I heard the question. Detective Morris was a... No, no, he did not ask you that. It's a dirty, brutal, cruel marriage. The witness must in no way volunteer information. I'm here on trial for my life. I may not obey all the rules. What are you going to do, take away my driver's license? The court is here to protect the defendant and will do so to the full extent of the law. Proceed. Do you know anything about firearms? Yes, I handled guns during the war. I wish to direct your attention, Mr. Ellis, to the moment when Detective Morris was shot. You concluded instantly that he was dead. Yes. How long after that did you leave the house? Ten minutes, maybe twelve. You just walked away from there without a word. About what? Was there a dead man lying on the floor? Yes. And you didn't even discuss with Mrs. Morris what story she was to tell the police? What happened was she was... No, I didn't ask you what happened. Did you? Let him answer the first question. Did you discuss with her what story she might tell the police? No. She said it was best for me to go and not be found there. I protested, but she insisted. I went very reluctantly. But you did not discuss with her then what story she would tell, if any? No, sir. Hmm. Proceed. So that when you left that house of death and horror, you didn't even know with what story the woman you loved would protect herself? Unfortunately, no. Are you asking this jury to believe that? Yes, I am. You're damn right I am. Mr. Ellis, do you want to change any of your testimony at this time? No. You love Mrs. Morris enough to trip 1,000 miles in a single night just to tell her not to worry? Yes. And up there in Sacramento, you laid out a perfect alibi with the help of a friend for one reason or another. Yes. At 2.30 a.m., you're down here with Mrs. Morris in her kitchen. Yes. Husband is upstairs asleep. Yes. And according to you, he surprises you both. Come. Answer yes or no. Help me piece it together. Yes, he walked in on us. And in self-defense, he has already shot at you once. You close in and tussle with him. Yes. And then the tussle was. You say that accidentally he is shot? Yes, in the chest. And you see instantly that he's dead. Yes. Mrs. Morris is naturally shocked at this. Yes. Shocked and horrified, wouldn't you agree? Yes, I agree. You see, we agree. We may even end up friends. I doubt it. <laughs> now, when I ask you how soon you left after the shooting, what did you say? Ten or twelve minutes, I said. Good, good. And then when I asked you if you wanted to change any of your testimony, you said that you didn't. Right? Yes, but... Guess what what? Go on. Nothing. You have your rights, you know. On this witness stand, you have the right to contradict or disagree with anything I say. You know that, don't you? I'm aware of the theory. As long as you are telling the truth and nothing but the truth. And you are telling the truth, are you not? I am telling the truth. What did you say your next moves were? I took a cab to the airport. And then you told us that you did not discuss with Mrs. Morris in any way what story she might later tell the police. I didn't know if she'd call the police or not. What did you think she would do? Let the corpse rot on the kitchen floor? That is terrible, Your Honor. Terrible. Yes. Deplorable, Counselor, but it is not a situation made by me. Gentlemen, address the court and not each other. It is not necessary, Mr. Stanley, to overstep certain bounds. Proceed. No more questions at this time, Your Honor. Judge Carey, your witness. Be frank and easy, Larry. I'm not sharpening my teeth on you. Mrs. Morris was a very special person in your life, was she not? Yes. And did you not say to the district attorney that she had filled a certain emptiness in your life? Yes. So that when you took that expensive plane journey, you were doing something that was very close to your heart, were you not? Yes, I was. And to come to the present, you say that despite all that has happened, you still love Mrs. Morris? If there was a chance, if it was granted to us, if I thought she still loved me, which I doubt, I would ask her to marry me again. No more questions. Ellis, it is left with this. When you walked out on this lovely lady, you didn't even know with which story she was going to protect herself. Is that right? I didn't know, no. Any objections, Judge Cairn? Let us move on. Then if it wasn't part of a preconceived plan, what explanation do you have for so readily abandoning your dearly beloved in the deepest crisis of her life? 
Does the witness understand the question? I don't see how he can. No, I don't understand that question. You were asked, if there was no preconceived plan, why did you so quickly leave Mrs. Morris, whom you allegedly loved, at a moment of such crisis? Can the witness answer? It seemed best that way at the time. It was a moment of panic, bad panic. She insisted... It seemed best to uh, cut and run and let her there to tell some crazy sort of lie? I didn't know that she would lie. Oh, did you think that with you gone, she would tell the police the truth? I couldn't think. My mind was numb. You were were working uh, instinctively. Feet do your duty, and they took you back to Sacramento. Yes. And when you instinctively found yourself there, you thought you might as well let your uh, prearranged alibi work. That's exactly how it happened, yes. Ellis, I need a straight answer. When you left that house of death in such haste, Wasn't it because you knew you had to get back north before daylight in order to make your alibi work? And was it not unnecessary for you to discuss things with the lady because you had already arranged with her what story she was to tell the police? No, sir, no. Your Honor, I do not care to ask this defendant a single other question. (sighs) Ah. The day of rest. I'm truly grateful for the inevitability of Sundays. It's a nice place you have here. Well, it's home. Judge, I've got lots of work back in town. We're in trouble. Both our clients, yours and mine. Are you putting Mrs. Ellis up in behalf of her son? Tomorrow, Tuesday, yes. She's our only character witness. Why do you ask, Mr. Santini? Because, as you damn well know, she's the crux of the case. With you leading her, she'll convince the jury that she's everybody's sweetheart, the best ma since mothers were invented. Where does that leave Ellis's alibi? But you must remember that she's my client. I can't... Okay, you can't throw rocks at her, but I can. I want her. I want her on cross-examine. And I want you to forget that she's your client. I want to show her to the jury if I can from her son's point of view. That's our only chance. I may fail, but I'm sure to fail if you joggle my arm. Do I gather that you intend to... I intend to take the skin off of her inch by inch and show her for the unmitigated monster that she is. I'm not there to pander to her ego. If I can, I'm there to show the jury the true basis for that alibi. I'm there to save my client's life. And incidentally, yours. Mrs. Ellis, are you yourself a God-fearing woman? Judge, for 34 years I've taught Sunday school in that very self-same church where my husband's forebears worshipped. Then bearing that in mind, I want you to answer my next question with fearless Christian courage and honor. Do you think, knowing him as you do, that your son is capable of deliberately murdering another human being? No, Judge Carey. I tell you under solemn oath that I do not. Thank you, Mrs. Ellis. I finished. If learned counsel doesn't object, people have only two or three questions to ask the witness. Uh, we will yield our plates. Thank you, sir. Then you may examine first. Well, I has your son, madam, in the past ever expressed in any way mortal fear and dread of you? Not to my knowledge. Then do you know any reason why he could have laid out his alibi because of fear of you? Mr. Nordau, he might well have misunderstood my intentions. He's been overwrought. The recent loss of his little son and keeping bad company. Well, now, exactly whom do you mean by bad company? That is not for me to say. Well, just one more question, if you please. Now, this needs only a yes or a no answer. Does your son fear you? I don't see how he could. That's all, Mrs. Ellis. Thank you. The defendant Morris may now examine him. I'm very puzzled, madam. I wonder if you could help me. How old will your son be on his next birthday, if he's not executed by the state, that is? Thirty-five. Thank you. You stated that your husband left a fund for your son's higher education. How ample was that fund? From a mere acorn, it grew to almost $16,000. Your husband left you very little, did he not? He was wiped out in the crash. 
Aside from a then worthless small portfolio of stocks and bonds, he left us penniless. What happened, ma'am, to that then worthless portfolio? Well, thanks to my wiser husband, I was familiar with Wall Street workings. It gathered moss. So you could not say that during your son's enrollment at Stephens College that you were in want? No. Many were much less fortunate. And during his actual college terms, am I correct? Your son lived at home with you in Pasadena? He came home every night. Well, now, let me see. Uh, every school day, rain or shine, didn't your son spend three hours in travel time? But excuse me, it was a very fine school. Oh, the quality of the school is not in question. But since economics were not pressing, why did your son come home every night? These questions are immaterial, irrelevant, and unrelated. The court thinks they are related and relevant examination. Objection overruled. But it was his wish to come home. Why not? Are you saying, ma'am, that an average youth willingly travels 200 miles a day by train, bus, and trolley to go to school? If we may trust the records, your Abraham Lincoln did. <laughs> are you equating your son with Lincoln? Or are you evading the real issue? Issue? Is there an issue? The issue, ma'am, is why did you compel your son to come home every night? Compel? He simply knew it was not easy for a widow to live alone in that great big house. Do you say that you were afraid? But of course I was afraid. But didn't you have a maid and a cook with you there? Sure, I'm talking about one's own kind. Oh, the cook and the maid were not of your own kind. Mr. Santini, I'm just as democratic as the next one. I meant kin. And so because he was kin, it pleased you to have him home with you? I think that that is a mother's right, don't you? I don't know. I'm not a mother. My son has always been free to speak his mind. What time would you have to get up to catch his daily train? Well, I myself am an early rider. I did not ask you what you are, ma'am. That's for the jury to decide. You are asked what time your son had to get up to catch his daily train. A few minutes past six. Mondays to Fridays, a few minutes past six? Yes. And you were not in want? And there was a $16,000 college fund? Yes. Oh, what happened after graduation? Your son went right to work? No. First, there was a small quarrel called the war. And on his return, he found them? A kind friend helped us place him with Scott Oil. But he stayed there only a year. Why? What happened? Well, as the senior Mr. Scott put it, they liked the cut of his jib. They wanted to send him to Venezuela in management. But Larry quit instead. Oh, if they liked him so much, why did he quit? Larry had already begun to court the young woman he hoped to make his wife. Oh, and that might be a reason for him not to go to far off Venezuela. Yes, he and Janet were already engaged, in fact. Then why didn't Mr. Scott keep him right where he was? They had a tip. Mr. Scott was extremely abusive. How do you know that, ma'am? It so happened it was the day I was there. What was their quarrel about? What? About my son's going to Venezuela. Larry flatly refused the job. Uh, is it not possible that your son had previously promised to take the job? Possibly. I'm not sure. Now, will you tell us, ma'am, with whom was Mr. Scott quarreling? Well, actually, with both of us. Oh, he was angry with you both? Yes. When did Ellis first tell you about the Venezuela deal? The night before, I believe. And the very next day, you appeared uninvited to Mr. Scott's office? Since you put it that way... To tell Mr. Scott that your son would not accept the Venezuela deal. But Larry had asked me to. I'm a bit puzzled. Why did your son change his mind? Well, I would say he had not thought it out before. In other words, he had intended to take the Venezuela job. I gathered so, yes. Now, why, ma'am, until you changed his mind, did the Venezuela job seem so attractive to your son? There's, I suppose, the call and lure, the... Romance of distant places. What about a simple desire to get away from home ties and domineering parents? Oh, that's always involved with the young. Mrs. Ellis, if your son was engaged to be married in the foreseeable future, why would he even consider taking a job 3,000 miles away? That was what I told him. It was senseless. In whose view is it senseless? In anybody's view. Well, can we be less general? Was it your son's point of view? I don't see how he could have seen it otherwise. But he had taken the job, had he not? Yes, but thoughtlessly. Oh, ma'am, is it not a fact that your son, not thoughtlessly, but with much real thought... No, that is not a fact. What is not a fact? It is not a fact that my son was planning to run away from Janet while their marriage was only six weeks off. Now, Mrs. Ellis, can we be intelligent? I'm as intelligent as anyone you will meet. But I do not believe in subversion of honor and dignity. I think in life we must meet and face our responsibilities or hide our heads in shame. Restrain yourself, madam. Now, can we say, ma'am, that some weeks later your son married that girl? 
Yes, and it was a brilliant wedding, too. And is it not a fact that your son wanted out from that brilliant wedding? No, certainly not. He had, of course, picked that girl himself. No answer. That question is beneath contempt. Restrict yourself to proper answers, madam. You don't think that fearing to displease you, your son went through with a marriage from which he desperately tried to escape? No. But I will say this. When I was young, there were higher standards and ethics in all walks of life, public and private. And you have always adhered to such standards and ethics? I have played the good game, yes. How, man, did you find out that your son was seeing Mrs. Morris? How? I was informed of it. And by whom were you informed? It was a matter of concern. By whom were you informed? I wanted to know. By whom were you informed, man? By a private detective. He came to me. Uh, just said, a minute, please. And by whom was this detective employed? I asked him to look into the matter. Don't you mean that you hired him to spy upon your unsuspecting son? I asked him to give me a report. Yes or no? Yes. An example, ma'am, of high standards and ethics? And what did you do with that report? I locked it away in a drawer. No, 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 ma'am. Armed with the report, didn't you the very next day briskly take yourself to the Morris home? Yes, I went there. And did you not, in a godlike, arrogant, and dictatorial way, threaten to expose Mrs. Morris to her husband? No, I told her I would not. Unless she stopped seeing Larry. Yes. And was that not in the most basic way another shameful attempt on your part to shape and twist to your own satisfaction the life of your son? You are putting it that way. Well, how would you put it, ma'am? Tell us. How? I was thinking of his good. Oh, he didn't know what was good for him. You knew better. What? What question is she asked to answer? Yes, the question is ambiguous. I will simplify. Is your son of age permitted to vote? Yes. Is he not a college graduate? Yes. Has he not seen life and death? Yes. And been off to a great historical war? Yes. And was he not twice cited for bravery and quick judgment under fire? Yes. And yet you dare to tell this jury that you had your son spied upon and followed for his own good? It was what I felt. Or did you not, ma'am, feel that your son was going to live the life the way you wanted it? Or he was not going to live it at all. I wouldn't say that. Only the jury man will decide what you're saying on the stand. After your visit to Mrs. Morris, did you phone your son in Sacramento? Yes. And you told him that you had found out about his friendship? Yes, and that I thought, I gave my opinion, it should stop. And what was the upshot of the conversation? Did he agree not to see her again? No, he kept saying we'd talk it over on his return. You realize, do you not, that you were making a demand? But not without justification from my view. Naturally. But how, since you were making a demand clearly so painful to your son, how did you intend to implement that demand? Implement it? Yes, back it up. Well, I told him I might have to fly up there. So that face to face in person, you would talk it out with him? That was the idea, yes. And since you had not accomplished your purpose by telephone, how, ma'am, would you accomplish it face to face? I'm not sure that I follow you. Don't you mean that if you couldn't intimidate him by phone, you could intimidate him in person? The witness in no way used the word intimidate. That's counsel's interpretation. Objection sustained. Strike the question. Adam. I ask you why, after your abortive phone call... Characterization of abortive is incorrect. Overruled. The witness herself has stated that the call was ineffectual. We are now concerned with why she told him she would fly up there. Can you answer the question, madam? It is somewhat true. I thought a personal visit would carry more weight. And why would a personal visit carry more weight? Young man, you are adding your peculiar interpretations to everything I say. And why would a personal visit to your son carry more weight? This is ridiculous. Is there any crime in the moral authority a mother might wield? After all... Control yourself, madam. But, Your Honor, he makes a mockery of everything right-thinking people hold dear. If I... Madam, you will have to restrain yourself or be held in contempt. Mrs. Ellis, answer with one word, yes or no. Is your son afraid of you? No. He does not fear to displease you? No. He did not knuckle under to you all his college life? No. You did not prevent him from taking a job? We talked. Where he might be free of your crippling coercion? Certainly not, no. You did not arrange for him a loveless marriage? No. That woman, this defendant, is not his friend. He's an only child. Oh, he is still a child to you. He's a man, but I'm his mother. Live only for him. Here's a portfolio of stocks and bonds that you live to handle. Come, come, that's unfair. I withdraw the remark. And this adult man, your son, is not afraid of you. No, he isn't. Not even a reasonable doubt in your mind? He isn't. No reasonable doubt? No, no, no doubt. She's answered him twice. Yes, counsel should move on. No. If it please the court, I shall not move on. I conclude my examination. No more questions, madam. Before the summing up begins... The court reminds the public that perfect order must be maintained. Let the record show that the jury are in the box 
Both defendants are present with counsel, and the state is represented. Judge Carey, you are recognized. May it please the court. Members of the jury, I'm going to speak to you as I would speak to the members of my own family circle, solemnly and sincerely from the depths of my heart. Because I believe in him, I am going to plead just as if Larry Ellis were my very own boy. Mr. Santini, you may address the jury. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been patient with us for six long weeks. You've been patient and silent. But now your voice will be heard at last. You will bring in the verdict. The prosecution wanted you to believe that at the wedding she gave all her drinks to her husband, thereby rendering him helpless for the shenanigans to come. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you are free to draw your own conclusions. But from other evidence that we have heard, it seldom seemed necessary for Detective Morris to be seduced into drink. Are, are we fools? If you planned to kill a man, what would you do? Would you go to his house hoping that his gun was available that night? That night of all nights? Or would you, with the simple intelligence of a mere boy, bring your own gun? Now, are we fools? Because that is what you are asked to believe. A serious step. A man and a woman pushed to the tragic bottom by a brutal husband and domineering mother. No, no way out except murder. Do they lose their wits too? Not bring their own gun? Hope that the other man has left his gun around for your convenience? Frankly, I was sickened by what the examination of Mrs. Ellis showed. By her own confession, she made every important decision in her son's life. Up to and including a loveless marriage. This entire case is a product of her vicious, malicious meddling and nothing else. What I am attacking is prosecution's contention that the reasons for Ellis' alibi were preposterous. But about that verdict, I think there can be no half measures. She is completely guilty as charged. Or as completely innocent of those charges as I believe her to be. Do not free her through weakness, through mercy, pity or sentiment. Free her because she is innocent. Gentlemen of the jury, you must excuse me, I'm a skeptic, a harsh, insensitive skeptic who swore an oath when he took this office to bring to the bar of justice any criminal in this county. Too many lucky accidents. They dovetail too neatly and begin to smell of plan and purpose. For instance, does Ellis have to be in far off Sacramento that week? Why not some other time when he won't need an alibi? And is it an accident that Mrs. Brown is out on a case that night? And just that night, does the Morris family have to go to a wedding where Mike is sure to get drunk? And is it an accident that Ellis comes to their home for the first time on one of the very few nights that Mike is there instead of on duty? And after the alleged accident of the shooting, not to mention the so-called accident of using Mike's own gun, isn't it peculiar, to say the least, that Ellis now has an accidental alibi with which to cover up his tracks? Ha, <laughs> really, aren't these dovetailed items more than just accidents? And I leave unmentioned the week old policy on her husband's life. Or do they add up these accidents to a planned and plotted killing which is no accident at all? Doesn't this show you that the alibi cannot be explained away by his fear of his mother, but is rather integral and joined to the rest like a roof on six floors of a house? No. For all the evidence tells me that they have jointly, 
aiding, assisting, and abetting each other, perpetrated one of the shrewdest, coldest, most atrocious murders this state has ever seen. And it is this very same state of California that asks you to bring in the verdict warranted by the evidence. Guilty of murder. Murder in the first degree. You must decide separately the question of the innocence or guilt of each of these two defendants. If you cannot agree upon the mutual innocence or guilt of both of the defendants, but do agree upon the single innocence or guilt of one of them, you may then render two different and distinctive verdicts. Finally, the jury is the bulwark of our American judicial system. Common sense, courage, rugged honesty, the satisfaction of both your intelligence and your conscience. All these count above technical knowledge or hair-splitting niceties. Your duty, ladies and gentlemen, is a solemn one, but it is not a difficult one if, in this hour, you have an eye single to that duty. Do you have the faintest idea of what Joe Morris meant to me? Yes. But she was a married woman, Larry. That's all over, son. That old dreary act. A brave, dignified, tolerant forbearance. Who the hell are you to be tolerant? You have great power to hurt Your me, pretense Larry. of being fair-minded. Of seeing all sides of a question. It's beneath contempt. Your assumption of superiority masking itself in modesty and humor. I watched you on that witness stand. Don't you think, son, that later you may regret much of what you are saying? Remorse, you mean guilt? No. That dark room where you lie with sick headaches. Headaches that were somehow always the fault of a little boy? No. That dark room is walled up forever. Larry, you are beside yourself. Save your breath. I permit you no moral or ethical superiority whatsoever. Stop it. Stop it, Larry. If you can't speak the truth, don't speak at all. The truth? What truth? That with your own son's life at stake, you search the whole state of California to find a broken-down, boozed-up old lawyer? A man who could take orders so you could run the whole show as usual? You are no different than your father was. Years of dreaming, despite all my best efforts, you are cut from the same boat. Like you, he was a vile, disgusting, ungrateful animal. And like you, married, he lusted after strange women. But vile as he was, he never conspired to take the life of a fellow man. I think I murdered that man. Yes. Yes, I do. Indeed, I do. Ah. Uh, oh, I'll call you. Right. Right. They reached the verdict out in the hall with a phone, brother. They're coming in. We've got a verdict. This is it. They're coming in. Better get ready, dear. The jury's coming in. I'm ready. Good luck, Mrs. Morris. Thank you. Jury's coming in. Jury's coming in. Let's go.
Jerry looking up or down? Up. You sure? Up. Ladies and gentlemen, quiet, please. Court is again in session. Did the record show that the jury is in the box? Both defendants are present with counsel, and the state is represented. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Please hand your verdict to the bailiff. Mr. Clark, please read the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Josephine Morris, not guilty of the crime of murder as charged. <laughs> We, the jury, find the defendant, Lawrence Ellis, not guilty of the crime of murder as charged. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This court is now adjourned. Judge, 20 minutes. What could he be saying to him? Thank you, Mr. Santini. Good luck, Marielas. The judge say, sir. You wish me well. Good morning. What did the judge say? Smoking like a fish. It's a friend of yours. <laughs> 